Hello, folks, and welcome back to World War Two TV. And we are sort of two thirds of the way through Eastern Front Week, and we've talked about Stalingrad in popular memory. Dave Stahl talked about Operation Barbarossa, so that was a really fantastic show. Then we had Ollie talking about the Fourth Guards Division, but today we're looking at kind of the roots of it all. We're looking at it from the point of view of the leader of the Soviet Union, Stalin's War. And my guest today wrote a book, one of those ones that in the last 12 months or so, upon reading it kind of made me reflect, checked, challenged my perceptions, made me um, pause and think about things. And it's a bit of a bit of a beast to get through Stalin's War by my guest, Sean McMeekin, who is a professor of European history at Bard College in upstate New York. So, uh, Good afternoon, Sean. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me on. It's a great pleasure. Well, the pleasure is all mine, I can assure you. So um, I want to start off, you know, we are in the middle of Eastern Front Week, and I'm, I'm going to admit that of the 300 plus shows I've done on World War II TV, less than 10% have focused on the Eastern Front. And some of that has been Polish heavy and Holocaust studies, which is sort of separate in some ways from the politics of it. Um, I'm trying to up my ratio, but you know, the, the people are drawn to the ETO and D-Day and Market Garden and the Pacific and Iwo Jima. And so my first question to you, and by the way, folks, hopefully this will be a show of a lot of a lot less of me talking, a lot more of my guest talking, because he's an eloquent speaker and has lots to say on this. But my first question to you, Sean, is why, why should we be examining the Eastern Front more, us Westerners, Americans and Brits? Because... It wasn't our war. Our war was where our people were. So why, why should we be, be studying it more than we are? Well, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think to begin with, uh, you're talking about center of gravity, both in terms of um, the amount of, of war material. Um, obviously, you're talking about casualties, uh, just the amount of damage done to the Wehrmacht. Um, uh, but also, of course, uh, the amount of casualties sustained by the Russians. So there's the human element as well. Uh, but when you say that the, the West wasn't involved, I mean, it's kind of interesting, of course, there were many offers um, on the part of Roosevelt and Churchill to get more involved in the Eastern Front, even in, in the case of perhaps contributing um, aerial units it's possibly under Soviet command. Um, and there was this massive material contribution. I mean, it was it was prioritized. I mean, literally the Arcadia Conference uh, shortly after Pearl Harbor, Britain and the United States decided that however important Pearl Harbor was to the United States, however important the war against Japan was to the United States, that not only was it Germany first, but that even against Germany, the number one priority was aid to Russia's offensive by all available means, which is to say that materially speaking, it was actually priority number one, uh, even above and beyond uh, any other needs in the North African theater or any of the other campaigns, the aerial campaign against Germany, the bombing campaign against Germany, that the actual focus was, in fact, on arming the Russians, supporting the Russians both uh, materially, financially, economically, in terms of foodstuffs, in terms of weapons, non-ferrous metals, industrial inputs, and all the rest of it. So it actually was the priority of the British and the Americans. It's just that I guess it gets elided somewhat because you're right, they weren't literally fighting on that front, even if there were some engineers and a few technicians who were involved around the edges. Um, but yeah, I think it's the war's center of gravity. It's where the war is really decided. Um, and uh, even from the perspective of, of British and American strategy, it, it, it was actually their priority uh, from 1941 onward. And that essentially is the thrust of your book, is that we have collectively viewed the war as Hitler's war, the Third Reich's expansion, the Third Reich controlling, and everything else is a reaction to that. But the the main point amongst many you make is that that's not necessarily what was going on. And that from, from your point of view and from the Russian point of view, Stalin was actually the, the mastermind behind how the war evolved. And it was very much a war he wanted and, and, and was shaping it from his point of view. And that's, that's not the way we, we perceive it. And the other thrust of your book is that effectively the, the impact of the Third Reich on the world world ended in with Hitler's death in, in 1945 and the 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 horrors of it carried on and we we understood the le the, the the holocaust and the effect of that and the human tragedy lived on but the actual effect on the world ended pretty much overnight whereas the Soviet Union and their influence carries on into China and Korea and uh, Asia generally and what happened in the Eastern Bloc and so Effectively, one of the points you make is that it didn't really end until 1989 and the final coming down of the Iron Curtain. So therefore, it's the Soviet war that had much more lasting effect on the world than the, the, the Third Reich, which is 
it's one of those things when you read it, it seems so obvious, and yet it's not really the way we've had it presented it presented to us. So yeah, that is your uh, your point. But you know, just for the sake of we can't cover everything in this show tonight, but uh, give a, you know break that down a little bit and how you came to that conclusion and why you think we should be looking at it from that point of view. Well, sure. I mean, I should differentiate a little bit between the idea that Stalin obviously is is the main victor in the way that I see the war, both in terms of uh, the spread, of course, of Soviet influence and in many cases, Soviet borders, and also just the lasting enduring influence of the Soviet Union and Soviet communism in Eastern Europe and Asia, as you're saying, even to this day in Taiwan. But as far as the war that Stalin wanted, um, I mean, this is the thing, it's easy to caricature this. And, and I understand why some people uh, are a little bit uncomfortable with the idea of saying, well, you know, after all, uh, you know, Hitler was the real dynamic figure and Stalin, like others, was just reacting. Um, it's not that I think Stalin controlled every single event which was transpiring between, hmm. say, 1937 and 1945, uh, rather that Stalin had a reasonably consistent approach to foreign affairs, which was actually much more successful than Hitler's. And uh, he didn't get the exact war he wanted in Europe. In fact, in Asia, it worked out far more closely uh, to Stalin's kind of ideal uh, design. That is what he wanted to happen, which was this kind of war of attrition between, as he saw it, the capitalist powers, which would eventually allow the Soviets to, to kind of sweep in at the right moment with a war of opportunity, exactly as they did in 1945. In Europe, it, it nearly turned out the way Stalin wanted. I think the real difference there was that while uh, Stalin definitely uh, saw the prospect of a war between Hitler and, and the Western powers, I mean, there's a little bit of this kind of almost game of chicken where uh, from Stalin's perspective, the Western powers were, of course, trying to, to trick Hitler into going to war with him. And you hear this a lot from Soviet diplomats in the 1930s. We're not going to do that again. You know, we're not going to have this happen again. We suffered so much in the First World War. Uh, this is even the, the theme of Stalin's so-called chestnut speech. We're not going to have them you know, pull, pull their chestnuts out of the fire for them. Um, it's actually pretty fairly clearly stated. That is to say that Stalin did not want to be sucked into a war effectively by the Western powers. Um, now that is the war that did break out over Poland, um, uh, first of all, with the molotov Ribbentrop Pact being signed, this obviously kind of helped uh, quiet Hitler's mind about uh, the Eastern Front and made it really possible and likely, in fact, that Hitler would invade Poland and Stalin had his own plans to invade Poland from the East. Uh, the brilliance of it, though, from the design of strategy was that Stalin had plausible deniability. You know, he claimed he was not actually at Brazil. He was not actually invading Poland. He was neutral. And in fact, the Soviet Union, and you'll, you'll still hear this phrase repeated today, was was a, a peace-loving power, a power that you know believed in, in peace. There was this imperialist war going on, and the Soviets were neutral. They weren't in the war. Um, yes, they made these opportunistic moves in Poland, later the Baltic states, and, and Finland, and later still Romania, but they were actually neutral. It was a war between Hitler and the Western powers. It was a war kind of in the capitalist world, and it nearly turned out uh, to Stalin's designs. The problem, of course, was that uh, the Germans just won everything too quickly. Uh, not mm. only did they uh, uh, crush resistance in Poland within a month, but of course the war, uh, first you have Denmark and, and Norway and, and then the Low Countries and France, but particularly France. I mean, no one expected France to fall as quickly as it did. Uh, that was you know, to the point where the Soviets initially, they celebrate this, I mean, quite openly. I mean, you have Maurice Torres, the French Communist Party leader, openly urging the French not to resist uh, the Nazis, not to resist the invasion, almost like a kind of con congratulatory perspective from the Soviets. So oh, nice work. I'm glad you're finally dealing with French and British imperialism. A friendly relationship, even with Hitler, that is, even though they were formally neutral. Um, but of course, Hitler's victories happened so swiftly and they were so decisive that it kind of altered the balance. Uh, you know, what Stalin would have actually preferred was a war of attrition a little bit more akin to what happened in the Pacific or really what had happened in the First World War, so that eventually Germany and the Western powers would have kind of bled each other white and the Soviets would have been able to eventually march in at a moment of their choosing. Um, this is actually stated in some form in, in a number of, of speeches and policy documents, the idea that the Soviets will kind of choose the right moment. Um, in the end, they didn't choose the moment. As we know, Hitler chose himself to invade the Soviet Union in June 1941. And, and the Soviets, although they had made military preparations, and you know we, we could talk about that in turn, they, they clearly weren't ready at the moment that Hitler invaded, which is to say they, hmm. they fought you know, in a very vulnerable, exposed position, but without really having come close to completing their own war plans. So, so it, it nearly upended all of Stalin's plans. And, and that's where I think the story gets more interesting that there is this kind of desperate fight for survival where it all nearly goes horribly wrong for Stalin. Um, but in, a, in the end, partly because of his own decisions, partly because of the Soviet 
kind of the learning curve and obviously getting much better at mobile warfare. Um, and then also because of the, the vast amounts of material aid sent in by Britain and the United States, especially the United States, so it's turned the tide. Um, in Asia, though, it's far more closely, I think, to kind of Stalin's design. Um, and he, he's, he's quite explicit about the fact that, that not only will he not help uh, the U.S. against Japan, that in fact he even has uh, huge massive massive numbers of U.S. pilots arrested after they crash land on Soviet territory after bombing raids on Japan. That he has this neutrality pact with Japan. He's quite loyal to this. He's quite happy to see Japan and the Western powers fight this kind of bloody war of attrition. And of course, on land in China, not really able to get as much aid to Chiang Kai-shek's armies as they would have liked, and so they end up with the so-called island hopping campaign, um, which is a little more peripheral, but still quite bloody. And by the time Stalin finally does intervene, Japan had really denuded uh, most of the Asian mainland of, of her best troops, transferring as much as a million troops back to the mainland and uh, you know, having sustained huge losses in China and the Pacific campaign to the point where, not easy pickings exactly, but where the Japanese mm. were obviously much more vulnerable than they would have been three or four years earlier. Uh, to a Soviet offensive. Um, so in Asia, it worked out perfectly from Stalin's perspective. I mean, that that last line you said, of things working out perfectly for Asia, is one of the things I was, I was looking at reviews of your book and looking at descriptions of it and things, and it's people challenging on the idea that Stalin wanted the war or he didn't want the war or he put up with the war. And you think, well, that's that's all, they're fair questions, except which war are we talking about? Because there's the September the 1st invasion of Poland war. But then, as you said there, there's the Japan-China situation. There's what's happening. It's not like there's our idea of when war starts. As a Britain-American is even slightly different in America. It's Pearl Harbor, Britain. It's, so it, it, the idea of it being a war, it depends on which war you're talking about. And he's judging it as the situation changes around it. But one of the things I want to bring back to, which I think is pertinent to what we've been talking about this week, is... We've been talking a lot on World War II TV uh, generally about the Germans not being prepared for a long war. The one, the last thing they want is anything to drag on. Adam Tooze talked about that length with yep. the economy and that side of things. What Stalin does know is whether or not he wants, if the timing is crucial, but he does know that if it does get to a war, he can win out attritionally over a longer period of time because of just the resources they have. So it's it's maybe the tr the first bit of the war is always going to be problematic for him but if he can somehow overcome that hurdle when it gets to the middle stage of the war he's kind of it's all going to be okay i mean that's a very simplistic way of putting putting it but that's you know for the point of view of the fact we've got an hour or so to talk about it that i find really intriguing that that he's playing a game of when exactly to sort of play his hand um and th this is the point you're making and uh, and I, I've got lots of things written down on my bit of paper I want to bring up. I and mean, you mentioned one of them earlier, as I think, already. And it's so I think we'll just sort of do a scattergun approach to this if you say okay with you. Um, I want to talk about the Winter War. That's one of the things I want to talk about in Finland. I want to talk about Lend Lease. And I definitely want to talk about what the Warsaw Uprising at some point uh, uh, later on. But let, let's go back to that sort of 39, 40 period when mm -hmm. things are changing. You say there's the, there's the pact between Germany and Soviet Union. And so you're, at what point do you think Stalin kind of commits to the idea of engaging the Germans? It could, because this is where people debate about whether Barbarossa surprised him or didn't surprise him. There's people say that you know, Stalin went into an emotional depression when Barbarossa started, but others will say, no, he was expecting it. So what what do you think, um, well, ex explain where you think it was that Stalin kind of commits the idea of a full conflict? Well, I think the timing is critical in every sense. And this is one of the things I try to do in the book is uh, to revisit things as they happen in real time, which is to say, uh, there's there's a version of writing about the Eastern Front where kind of everything starts on June 22nd, 1941. You know, there might be this prelude and there's talk of it. It's mentioned that there was this Molotov Ribbentrop Pact and of course the official Soviet or Russian claim as well. This was just to buy us time. And, you know, we knew we were going to fight uh, the Germans eventually. Um, uh, I, I don't buy that. I don't buy it because it doesn't actually fit most of the data that we have and most of the statements that were made at the time. I mean, sure, there's this sense that it's a truce and the two sides have been, of course, denouncing each other uh, for years. But remember, they'd also been collaborating on and off for years mm -hmm. back to 1922 in Rapallo. There's even a trade agreement signed shortly after Hitler comes to power. Uh, there's all kinds of exchanges of information regarding military resources 
forces of the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact wasn't just about territory swapping. It was a it was a, a large sweeping trade agreement. It had a lot of significance for the Germans in particular, who were worried about the British blockade, cutting them off from critical resources so that they had access to Soviet grain and cotton and, and manganese, um, in particular oil, petroleum. Um, so it was very, and, and even rubber, although it was mostly transshipped across Asia. Uh, the Germans also, of course, had to rely on Scandinavian resources and Balkan resources, but the Soviets were a huge part of this equation, allowing Hitler even to, to contemplate a slightly longer war. Again, he never wanted a longer war, but realizing that if there was a British blockade, to some extent, he had to have the Soviet resources. Again, whether by trade and persuasion, which is what they did the first couple of years, or later on by invasion and occupation. As far as that early period, again, I don't think either Hitler or Stalin knew exactly how things would play out. Um, the Germans probably did expect that they would defeat Poland fairly quickly. They weren't sure France and Britain would intervene. Uh, even after the war, they, they weren't entirely sure that the war would continue. I mean, Hitler does make a speech of the Reichstag, more or less kind of saying, you know, look, you know, this is over now. I mean, you know, can we make peace? Um, admittedly, you know, with the, with the implied threat that if you don't make peace, you know, I'll crush you. Uh, but no one knew for sure. And in fact, when when people talk about this winter war stretch in the Finnish war, and I mean, we can revisit that later with obviously mm. the, the critics of my book, part of the, the idea is, oh, well, there was just a sideshow. Again, I think this is distended by the, the lens of hindsight. The winter war is only, it's only, it's only a sideshow if you already know what happens between 1941 and 1945 in the Eastern Front, if you already know, you know about the Gutter Dammerung in Berlin and the Pacific War and, and the dropping of the A-bombs and all the rest of it. At the time, it was the biggest event in the world, the Soviet invasion of Finland. That is what the world was focusing on. That's what the world's press was focusing on. The League of Nations actually expelled the Soviet Union after the Soviet Union invaded Finland, something which had not happened to any of the Axis powers. I mean, the League secretary literally says rather caustically, you know, those, those powers at least had the decency to resign from the League before committing acts of armed aggression. Uh, the Soviets were kicked out of the League of Nations. Um, I mean, there was almost universal condemnation, even from the part of some of Stalin's own partners. Like, I mean, Hitler stays quiet, but the Germans are very much kind of sympathizing with the Finns, as are a bunch of other countries. Um, and, and Stalin really was in, in a pickle. He was in a very difficult situation that winter. Um, his early moves in Poland had gone fairly well. I mean, obviously very darkly, because he and Hitler were already kind of doing these prisoner exchanges and uh, deportations, and in the Soviet case, massive expropriation of property, and all these Polish officers and elites shipped off to labor camps in the Soviet Union. But from Stalin's perspective, that had gone well. Uh, the early partial occupation of the three Baltic states that already proceeded in October 39, and this is not a full-on military occupation, it's more about kind of basing rights, but it's clearly uh, preliminary to a larger occupation. But then the Finns, they say no, and, and the Soviets are kind of shocked. I mean, they, they have them so massively outgunned and outnumbered. The Finns don't really get any pledges of armed support from any of their neighbors uh, or even from the Entente powers or what, what used to be called the Entente powers, the British, Britain, and France. Um, that is to say, the Western powers. Um, so the Finns are pretty much on their own, and yet and yet they say no when Stalin makes these demands for territory and, and basing rights. And the Soviets are kind of shocked. They they really initially don't know what to do. And then when they do invade, it doesn't go well. I mean, famously, it doesn't mm. go well. They get bogged down in the, uh, the Karelian Isthmus. Um, you have all the legends of the, the Finnish ski snipers and the Molotov cocktails and, and tanks being either sunk on the frozen lakes or grounded um, or, or simply incinerated. Um, uh, the, the few Finnish pilots able to get up in the air and some other antiquated airplanes have these dogfights and generally get the better of that too. So the Soviets are really struggling massively in this war. And the, the press reports are just horrendous. I and mean, the Soviets are getting humiliated on, on the world stage. Um, so I don't think there was a grand plan at that point. I think Stalin was really, um, you know, certainly not about, he wasn't thinking about the future war with Germany by any means. I mean, to some extent, they were in such a weak position at the time, what they were actually concerned about, and that's a thing that I, I spent a lot of time on in the book, of course, is, is the specter of, of, a, of an Anglo-French intervention against the Soviet Union, uh, both with the talk of an amphibious landing at Pitsamo, the Barents Sea, basically in the north of Finland, and, and of course then also the, the somewhat notorious, though often forgotten, um, plans to bomb uh, the oil fields and derricks of Baku and possibly also the refineries at, at Batumi, uh, where eventually they did carry out the surveillance overflights and they sent the, the Blenheim bom bombers, the squadron, about 48 or so Blenheim bombers to Habani, the base in Iraq. Um, but where, of course, in the end, as we know, you know, this wasn't carried out. Um, now, I, I know Stalin took all this quite seriously. I mean, we see all kinds of evidence of this, that 
This is when he introduces this somewhat grotesque institution of the controlled attachments, these NKVD machine gunners behind the main units to, you know, to shoot his own men if they don't advance forward, if they retreat or hesitate. Um, uh, this is when, for example, he um, uh, really takes the, I think, somewhat brilliant and un unappreciated decision uh, to sue for an early peace with Finland. Um, basically because the Soviets just, they need a way out and Stalin wants to cut the legs out from under allied intervention plans. Uh, then the other thing he did was order up what we now call the Katyn massacre, this preemptive yeah. strike, all those Polish officer prisoners. Um, and it, uh, my students sometimes ask me like, what does that have to do with um, Finland or Baku or allied intervention plans? It's true, it's only indirectly or tangentially related, but as far as how they justified internally Stalin and Beria, um, it's about decapitating this potential fifth column threat as they see it, um, that Polish resistance might be organized by the leaders of the former Polish army, uh, along with some of the, they have all these other categories of kind of class enemies, other political and economic elites who they think might lead troops into battle or lead some kind of an internal uprising. Uh, of course, in the sense that they were already labor, forced labor prisoners, uh, it does seem somewhat unrealistic to think they would have been a security threat. But in Stalin's mind, this was connected both with the threat of allied intervention against him and the fact that as he, as he well knew, there were many Polish soldiers and pilots training, uh, particularly in Britain, um, many of whom would actually later fight in the Battle of Britain in the RAF uh, for possible deployment, whether in Scandinavia or even possibly in, in, in the Caucasus. And Stalin, of course, had the superlative intelligence network. And so you know, he might have exaggerated the threat, which is what statesmen often do, but he saw it all as quite threatening. So I don't think at that stage he was even thinking about the possibility of of a war uh, with Nazi Germany. I mean, to some extent, he was just happy to get out of that war. And then, um, although initially he's a little bit annoyed that the Germans try to mediate a peace between uh, the Soviets and Finland um, after the Germans you know, make their move, beating the British to the punch in Norway, this kind of relieves Stalin where he yeah. thinks the British bogeyman or the British kind of threat is, is dissipated. And, and then there's a new sort of era of good feelings uh, with Hitler and the Germans. Uh, you know, where they really kind of urge on the Germans and they actually step up things like fuel deliveries, you know, as the Germans invade France yeah. in the Low Countries. So, so no, I don't think it, it, at that stage, either Hitler or Stalin had really contemplated a break. I think you, you, to get to that part of your question, you know, when does this become both a serious, compelling interest and obsession of, of really of both dictators, that is, that they're going to break with one another and, and end up engaging on the battlefield. I don't think that really happened until the fall of 1940. I mean, it is true that, you know, there, there are these remarks that a lot of historians uh, have noticed about, you know, they're talking with generals about, like Holder, for example, about the possibility of... Possibilities, yeah. The possibility of plans, but he doesn't, he doesn't actually issue the directive which points the way to this specific operational objective of reaching the Volga. You know, that's in December 1940. Um, and, you know, this is something that uh, I think Roger Morehouse proposed something of this to this effect in his book, Devil's Alliance. And I actually discovered a lot more evidence basically just supporting his own thesis, which I thought I thought was quite clever that, in fact, things really broke down in, in the Balkans. Um, I think I go into a little more detail in my book about the reasons that they broke down and really what the kind of the serious interests were at stake when Molotov goes to Berlin and meets with Ribbentrop and uh, Hitler in November 1940. Um, you know, the Soviets were at that point being invited to join uh, the tripartite pact, which the kind of cosmetic retouching of the old anti common turn pact of 1936 it was no longer directed against the Soviets. That is, it was directed against the Anglo-Saxons, meaning Britain and the United States behind or even though the U.S. was still neutral. But so the um, the idea was the Germans would invite the Soviets to join. Now, admittedly, the Germans had this self-interested idea where the Soviets would just focus their attention south. Um, and they wouldn't pay as much attention, the Germans hoped, uh, to the Balkans. Um, the reason the Germans were so concerned about the Balkans is that in addition to all the, all the resources they were getting from the Soviet Union, the Balkans were also a huge source of non-ferrous metals, and in particular chrome. And the chrome they didn't get from the Balkans, they got from Turkey by way of the Balkans. And so uh, there was also the oil in Romania, which furnished about, a, about a half, really, almost 52 or 53 percent of the needs of the Reich. And so the German had, they had huge economic interests in the Balkans. And, and the Soviets effectively said, I mean, look, to join your Axis or Tripartite Pact, uh, you need to, first of all, withdraw all of your personnel from Finland. Um, you need. They, they were also pushing to have uh, greater occupation rights in Romania, Bessarabia, and also Bukovina. Um, and they also demanded the right to, uh, to send and station troops at the Bosporus and the Dardanelles in Turkey guarding the Straits, access to the Mediterranean, and to have what they called a guarantee, by which was effectively meant, again, an occupation of Bulgaria. 
Um, and the Germans refused these terms. And I actually discovered in the Bulgarian archives of all places, this kind of rant, you know, where Hitler meets the Bulgarian minister in Berlin, Parvin Draganov, and again, he just rants for about three hours about Stalin's, as he sees it, ultimatum. Um, and it's within two weeks of this that he issues this order, again, preparatory to you know, the invasion planning of the Soviet Union. Now, as far as the Soviets, I mean, clearly, if you look at kind of deployment and planning and spending and, and you know, what they're spending their resources on, um, again, it's not static. I mean, at, at this point in fall of 1940, uh, they were actually spending a lot of money on these kind of amphibious tank units and airborne brigades. I think they were actually thinking of and planning for exactly what Molotov was talking with Berlin, uh, with, with uh, Hitler about in Berlin, which is to say uh, a landing at, at the Turkish Straits uh, and in Bulgaria. Um, it is, you know, it's only after this, the first six months or so of 1941, I mean, the break has already occurred by then, you know, Bulgaria, the Germans, they get Slovakia and they get Hungary to sign on the Trabartite Pact along with uh, Romania and Bulgaria kind of wavers a little bit before finally taking the plunge because they're wary of a, of a Soviet intervention. Um, but by January, February, 1941, it's clear the break has already basically happened. Um, you know, it's not clear yet how and when the war will start, um, but, you know, both sides are already conducting overflights and, you know, surveillance, though they're arming heavily to the teeth. The Soviets are, are just pouring troops and war materiel and tanks and petrol stations and tank parks and aerodromes. That's the, they're building these aerodromes. One of the other things I discovered, uh, the 251 new aerodromes that they were building in 1941, 199, basically 80% of them were in the occupied frontier districts uh, taken since the Molotov for Control Pact. So they're clearly preparing for something. I, I don't think they were going to be ready to fight yet by June or July 1941, but they were clearly preparing for war. I think Stalin was probably just hoping he had more time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Germans clearly just beat him to the punch. Well, I mean, so much to unpack in what you said there, which is fantastic, but um, I want to bring you back to a couple of things you said. One is the Balkans, and one is the, the possibility of Anglo-Franco involvement in Finland, because one of the things that your book does well is you is it, it's not it's non-linear in the sense you do talk about what's actually happening, but you you bring up that you start spinning these plates effectively of the counterfactuals and the what ifs and the possibilities of this, but you somehow ma manage to keep spinning throughout the book without any of them actually falling off there. If I'm going to keep on the spinning plate metaphor there, they all keep going. And that's uh, it, what, I, what I found particularly challenging about it because it, the Balkans, for example, is the Gordian knot that just untangling it, you know, and I, tr I try to set up a Balkans week I ended up doing one show about uh, um, about well, basically who was who, essentially, just a breakdown of who the various factions are within Yugoslavia. That, and you realize how complicated it is and how it often historians just, well, I'm just going to ignore that because it's just a, 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 so complicated to get into. But with the counterfactuals, that's some of the, the, the pushback you've had is that you do get start off these things that didn't happen. But I'm always reminded of the fact when we talk about Britain, for example, in 1940, we now know that the idea of the Germans sending paratroopers dressed as nuns was never going to happen. But the point is, it was a perceived threat at the time. It was something people were talking about at quite a high level, that the possibility of this fifth column within Britain. So to me, the fact you get these, you start spinning plates of things that, that we know with hindsight didn't happen, doesn't matter because at the time there is a possibility if things had gone a little bit differently, then it might have gone down that path. And that that's that to me is what made it really challenging and rewarding at the same time is that for want of a few things changing here and there, things might have might have changed very dramatically. And and that that in itself is is interesting. So when my question from that, therefore, is when you were writing it, it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that you were trying to write each chapter blocking from your brain what you knew would happen a year or two years later, which is very hard to do because you can't un unknow what you know. And as you say, we do know that it end, the war ends with the atomic bombs in, in August 45, but trying to go back and pretend we didn't know that was going to happen is very hard. So was that something you kind of actively did to try and focus on, okay, it's, for example, the fall of 1940, Let's forget we don't know that Barbarossa is happening yet. Let's we don't know what's happening there. Try and focus on what what might have happened in that particular time with the information everybody had at that particular moment. Well, it's a fascinating question you raise. Um, I'm actually going to cite um, a popular historian who's not always that well regarded by professionals, and she does sometimes get her facts wrong. And I've actually been quite critical of her work. 
the guns of August about the outbreak of World War I, but Barbara Tuckman in one of her essays about the writing of history called Practicing History, uh, she actually made a really important point. And while she didn't always get all the details right, she was not a great kind of archival researcher. You know, she had certain limitations in the amount of material she was able to access for, for some of her books. Her principles are very good. And one of the principles, which I think made her such a great storyteller, um, and, and I, I can't remember exactly how she phrased it, but the essence of it was that uh, statesmen or generals, officers, or ordinary serving men at the time have no knowledge of the future. And so when you're writing about them and the decisions they make and the actions uh, that they pursue, uh, you should keep that in mind. You should not judge them or describe uh, possibilities which had not occurred to them. That is to say, they were dealing with the information known to them at the time. Uh, no historian is perfect. I mean, we all have, as you say, the hindsight. We kind of know how the story turns out. However, I think that the best kind of uh, storytelling, effectively kind of reconstruction of history as, as it actually happened, because I mean, gedazenist, if you're going to use the Runka phrase, you do have to try to put that out of your mind. Um, so that when you are writing, let's say, about Hitler and Stalin and Molotov and Ribbentrop or uh, the Soviet, uh, the Winter War in Finland, uh, you have to understand that at the time, no one knew what was going to happen between 1941 and 1945. Yeah. I, some people do, they have a kind of almost violent reaction to this. I think it's quite clear you talk about counterfactuals. Um, and you're right, I do, I suppose, spin them out or allude to them in the sense that I talk about things which might have happened but didn't. Um, but I think people miss what they misunderstand or sometimes either deliberately or willfully is that what I'm trying to explain is both what did happen and also what didn't happen. And I don't think you can understand what did happen unless you understand what didn't happen. And at times what did happen was significant enough, which is to say, yes, it's true that Britain and France ultimately did not declare war on the Soviet Union, did not intervene yeah. against the Soviet Union. However, the, the rather loud talk about this intervention, which reached the ears of Stalin, caused Stalin to take certain actions. And to me, that's the real point of that chapter, which is to say, this is why Stalin sues for an early peace with Finland on slightly less punitive terms than he probably could have gotten. This is why Stalin orders this, this horrendous, uh, supposedly kind of preemptive massacre of, of the Polish officers and elites we now call the Katyn massacre. Um, that is to say that the near actions actually did have an impact on history. And if I allude to them later as something like a missed opportunity, and I suppose some people might, might object to this. Some people, I think some of the critics have said, for example, that I'm, I'm advocating the policy line, or I, I'm trying to give advice, to trying to say, this is what they should have done. And I could see how you could kind of twist a phrase and make it sound like what I'm trying to do is get in the ears of these policymakers and saying, this is what I think you actually should do to give a kind of moral and strategic coherence to the war. That's not really what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is explain what they were thinking about at the time. The problem yeah, exactly. what, what, what they may have decided to do based on right. what they believe or thought they believed at the time. And it's right. I mean, the pact, we could keep, we could keep going back to the pact, but the, the pact when it was signed was a different thing to what it was even probably two weeks later it already become different things to different people and certainly by june 41 it was it was a very different thing so right. writing about it now as if it was a constant it it, it wasn't really a constant because it wasn't that it, it couldn't have been because the situation was always going to be evolving around it changing the, the status of it pretty much day by day if not even hour by hour now I want to kind of go back and, and ask a question because there are we've got viewers who are asking questions, so it's something out of sync. But I I want to put it up before I get it scrolls back too far. I won't be able to find it again. So this is from Marks and Sparks, and he's asking at what stage does Stalin basically run out of men to fight the war with after the losses of 41, 42? Can he afford to keep retreating into Siberia? Will he be usurped by a coup if there's no win in Stalingrad? So I know it's not quite what we've been talking about, but I don't want to lose that one. From later on, it, it just seemed to be a good question as well. Do you want me to tackle that now, or do you want to? Cut yeah, sure. Just, well, just, just. Well, yeah, no, please. I'll try to be. It's a great question. I mean, it's not one with, with a very clear answer. I do think, had the casualty rate of nineteen forty one to forty two, particularly nineteen forty one, had that casualty rate been sustained, then yes, I do think the Soviets would have run out of men. I can't give you a precise date. You know, doing a calculation in my head probably by sometime around uh, 1943 or 44. Again, it had that same rate been sustained. Obviously, the, the ratio started to even out a little bit after 1942. And that's part of where I think Lend-Lease really enters the story. Um, some of it is the learning curve. The Soviets obviously just get a little better. They fight a little harder also in 1941 once uh, the Wehrmacht reaches kind of proper 
Soviet or Russian territory as opposed to the frontier battles, you know, where it really is kind of occupied territory where the Red Army had always been seen as something of an occupied an occupier, that is to say, a lot of the locals were probably willing to help out the Germans when they invaded. And to some extent, that was true in Ukraine, too. It's a painful and sensitive subject. But you know, as we know, there are many places in Ukraine where, where the Germans were welcomed in. I mean, not, not universally, but, but certainly where they didn't meet massive universal resistance. Um, as far as the, the manpower, I do think that that's, that's quite significant. And in fact, you can actually look at sort of like the rates of losses and so on. By 1943, in fact, the Soviets were bleeding manpower more quickly than the Germans were, and the German army was actually expanding uh, to a point of, at, at worst, parity, really, in, in terms of manpower, in terms of military manpower with the Soviets. I think the material schlacht questions ultimately are a little bit more decisive, which is to say, I do think that absent the massive Lenly say to get not just the finished articles, but the industrial inputs in particular, you know, things like the rolled steel, things like armored plate, uh, things like aluminum in particular, um, all kinds of non-ferrous metals, uh, ball bearings, stainless um, chrome ball bearings, stainless steel and chrome ball bearings, all kinds of materials without which the Soviets couldn't have even built their weapons. Um, and even just the foodstuffs, um, that is, yeah. they continue to- Spam, to spam and, uh, and butter, which you bring up in your book, which I have to confess, it was something I hadn't well, it's come into my mind about being part of lend particularly. Right, right before uh, Stalingrad, uh, you know, the, the German offensive operation Blau into the steppe, Stalin quite literally tells his men, we no longer even have an advantage in terms of arable land over the Germans. They had lost so much arable land, they had lost so much industry, they had lost so much of the materiel, you know, things like iron ore, things like manganese, things like in particular aluminum, which was absolutely critical in, in the construction of soap tanks and warplanes. Uh, I think without that lend, we say they would have lost the material schlacht uh, much earlier than they did. Now, it's true the Germans themselves had kind of shot themselves in the foot because there was so much scorched or sabotage. Uh, but the Germans, and we actually can see from their own files, while they were obviously frustrated, a lot of factories had been sabotaged or, or, or blown up. Um, they weren't all sabotaged or blown up. Um, I mean, the entire complex of basically Red Army uniform and boot supply, which is mostly in the kind of the Baltic region and and northwestern Russia was captured almost intact by the Germans. One of the reasons why the Red Army, they, they also wouldn't, wouldn't have been clothed. They wouldn't have had boots without lend lease. Um, and the reason is because the Germans had actually captured all the factory. So no, the manpower is a great question. Um, uh, you know, you could definitely kind of crunch some numbers and you know, look at the rates, the casualty rates from a certain point in 1941. Of course, nothing is ever static, as we were just saying. You know, things yeah. do change. And yes, by 1942, the you know, the, the casualty ratios were still lopsided. They weren't as lopsided as they had been in 1941. And by 1943 and 44, of course, the Soviets improved further. It, it, it's yeah. But that said, they've they evened out. But um, let, let's, let's expand on Lend-Lease because that I found one of the most fascinating parts of your book. But also, it's a history that I'm a bit protective about because being British, you know, you can't, or Canadian, our Canadian viewers, you end up in the, the Arctic convoys come in and I've done shows with people who've written about these incredible merchant Navy men who endure just the most impossible conditions, taking out these shiploads of stuff to, 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 to Russia. And so there's a, there's an emotional baggage of the lend lease. And of course the imagery around it at the time, it was a, it was a symbol of the cooperation between Stalin and Roosevelt and Churchill and the, and the posters that accompanied it and the propaganda films and the pathé and people going to newsreels, whether they're in Chicago or London. It was That was the one thing they could record. Because we were fighting on separate fronts, except for the peripheral advisors, the one thing that I said genuinely kind of connected the, these two, the Westerners and the Easterners moving, was, was Lend-Lease. And, and yet you make this, this point that, after a certain point, basically, I'm, I'm I'm simplifying it a bit. We could have, we should have just basically said, or you're not suggesting we should. You said it maybe, maybe they should have just stopped. So, so I mean, I've I've put it very simplistically there. I'm sure you could word it better than that. Right? Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, that that's one possibility. Again, these are counterfactuals. We're talking about things that didn't happen. Obviously, given the views of Roosevelt, Hopkins, and others on lend lease, they weren't suddenly going to stop it, even if there was some congressional uh, scrutiny at the very least and concern by 1943 over how the resources were being used and the Soviets were not at all forthcoming about, about how the material was being used. Um, it's just if you actually look at the original statute, the way it was, it was justified both legally, politically, and to some extent morally, it was supposed to be a program of military necessity for uh, the United States, which is to say that let's say in 1941, 
1941, you do have the possibility of a Soviet collapse. You know, you have a very good argument to be made. It's not just this kind of moral argument of let's help out the Soviets because the Germans have invaded and because they're suffering and because they need our help. There's also the strategic argument. Look, if the Soviets collapse, the Germans will have the massive resources of the Soviet Union, will be kind of almost unbeatable. Um, and presumably there's something, even though the U.S. was not yet at war before Pearl Harbor, uh, the Roosevelt administration would have obviously seen, and, and a lot of other Americans would have agreed, would have seen this as a security threat also to the United States. After the Battle of Moscow, and I think more specifically after both the Battle of Stalingrad and then Kursk, 42-43, um, it's pretty clear the Soviets aren't going to collapse utterly, which is to say uh, the argument is a little bit different. And Congress does revisit this, and they actually have a vote on it. It's just the way it had been designed kind of ingeniously was that you had to vote the whole thing up or down. You couldn't disaggregate by country. Now, there was no line item veto. There was no disaggregation of we want to have uh, some discretion over aid sent to this country or that country. You had to either vote for the package as a whole or reject it. And so it wasn't just the Soviets, of course, Britain is also getting lend lease aid, China, um, all these other countries are getting lend lease aid. And so to vote against the package uh, would have effectively meant you were against all of that too. And that was just politically almost unthinkable for, for most uh, congressmen and senators. And so of course they didn't, they, they reauthorized it. Uh, the thing is they, they had effectively abdicated all authority over this massive program uh, to the White House. Um, but I mean, there are a lot of American historians uh, you know, who look back on this as, as a real kind of a seminal moment in US history, not even before Pearl Harbor, that is the passage of the Lend-Lease Act effectively it's a kind of abdication of the authority of Congress over expenditure, which is to say that the White House has given this almost unilateral authority to tap the vast hydraulic resources of the US economy uh, to the benefit of, of almost any country uh, the president chose uh, to aid with almost no discretion or oversight. Um, and so in the end, I mean, the decisions, they're, they're ultimately decisions, I think they're, they're perfectly uh, valid to, to subject to judgment because they were decisions taken almost exclusively by the Roosevelt administration. Yes, critiques kind of pour in. You get people writing their congressmen. You get people asking, you know, why it is that we have butter shortages and you know, are the Russians greasing their boots with our butter? Perhaps it sounds insensitive because the Russians are, are suffering so much in the war. But on the other hand, Americans don't understand why they're being told they have to put up with margarine and they're sending all their butter to Russia, for example. You know, why are there pork shortages um, because of the vast quantities of spam that were being sent? Why are there shortages of bailing? leaves because they're sending, you know, infinite millions and millions of tiny boxes of dehydrated borscht, uh, you know, to Russia. Um, so there are shortages. I'm sure they love that. I'm sure they were, that was, the, that was their favorite. Yeah. I'm sure, probably yeah. like that better than the spam, you would think. Um, you know, so yeah, people raise these questions and these concerns, but no, in the end, the decisions were made uh, by the White House. And you're right that, okay, just stopping it entirely would have been in some ways probably almost just morally unthinkable. There would have been kind of outrage. Oh, why, why are we leaving the Russians, you know, out to dry? But that said, instead of keeping it at roughly the same level or perhaps slowly curtailing it once the strategic, the dire strategic necessity had, had passed or the equation had altered by, uh, particularly by summer 1943. Instead, it goes the other way. It ramps up into the stratosphere. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was something that I don't think I'd realized. And again, I want to, it connects with me is that we have an image, uh, I as a Brit, of an example of, I, I think of the USA with its logistics and production in, in terms of 1945, even perhaps 1946. I'm thinking that scene in Best Years of Our Lives when Dana Andrews goes to the airfield, wherever the hell it is, with just kajillions of B-17 sitting there. And you think that this incredible industrial might was achieved. But of course, it, it the curve to get there meant that in 42, perhaps, which is when we're talking about when perhaps then lease could have been eased off or reduced or something or less frequently sending stuff there. That's exactly when the USA hadn't reached yet, yet reached this peak it was going to reach later on. And for the Allies as well, you know, we know that Churchill needed more resources for the, the Sicily and Italy. And then there's the Bengali famine, which we're going to go down that rabbit hole there. But 42 is a crucial time for supplies for everybody. This is the era of the Brits and in, in the Mediterranean having to decide where to put their limited resources okay if we put money into this convoy in the mediterranean that's less people on the north on the north atlantic mines if we put more aircraft or whatever it would be into north africa that's less here we, we are constantly paying peter to pay the i always get that metaphor mixed up you know the one i mean so, so yeah yeah so the point is is the lend list thing ended up or or, or suggestion you're making is that all we ended up doing is giving 
the Soviet Union so much more power by 1945, which therefore brings us back to that point we said at the beginning about the shaping of the post-war Europe, because the, the Soviets are now marching and we know what happened to Poland and Czechoslovakia and so on and so forth. So it's just something you suggest, that, but it's, it's way more because you devote a lot in your book to Lend-Lease. We are, we are scratching the surface of it in this conversation now. But again, to me, it's about the bringing it into the into the debating forum and discussing it, because I just don't think we've discussed Lend-Lease. It's just been an accepted thing that happened. And, and what you did is just have caused us to look at it differently and go, perhaps, or isn't this interesting? And, and I find that just in, innately interesting. So, um, and how difficult was it to find this information about Lend-Lease? Or were you, did, did you feel you were someone's the first person blowing dust off this, these archives? Because it's, it isn't something I've read in my however many 1,200 books I've got on my shelf there. It doesn't come up very often. Well, I'm, I'm certainly not the first. I mean, there are other historians. Um, uh, Robert, I think, Hume Jones, if I have the name correctly, wrote a book, Roads to Russia, uh, several decades ago, using some of the recently declassified materials. Um, there have been others who have looked into various aspects of Lend-Lease. Um, the Hopkins papers in particular, and some of the Statinius papers that I saw, uh, the Hopkins papers are in the FDR library in Hyde Park, uh, the Statinius papers uh, are basically in uh, College Park, Park, Maryland. A lot of that, I think, was kind of um, uncharted territory. Um, I definitely found a massive amount of, of information that I don't think had been discovered before by historians, even if they had the kind of the broad outlines, a lot of the granular detail I think I was able to fill in. When it comes to the Russian side of the story, though, uh, first of all, it's a very sensitive, delicate subject in Russia. There, there had been until uh, just a couple of years ago a lend Museum in, in Moscow. It's possible that it has since been reopened, but the last uh, back around, I think, 2017, um, I talked actually to to the founder, and he had said they had shut him down, and I don't know mm -hmm. what this kind of story was. It's something that they definitely don't want to talk about in Russia. And talking about, let's say, I want to look at, you know, the Soviet military archives and try to find out exactly you know, what percentage of, um, you know, Sherman or uh, Matilda tanks were being sent into various units. Um, this is not something that, uh, this is not information they part with lightly. Um, let's just say that uh, it was not easy to get this information. I think I'll just try to leave it at that. Um, as far as the, the question you're talking about, 1942, I mean, again, that, that's obviously a pivotal year uh, also for the Russians on, on Western, and, and it does make sense. You could certainly make the argument that, look, painful as that was uh, for Britain's interests in North Africa and the Mediterranean, you could definitely make the argument that, let's say, the Soviet need was more pressing. However, in addition to the actual material being sent, there were the, the crushing losses on uh, the North Atlantic route, uh, the lend convoys. I mean, some of them lost as much as 60 or 70 percent of, of tonnage and, of course, you know, all men aboard. Um, the losses are absolutely horrendous, you know, and I think like wh where it gets interesting to me, I know the Russians don't, these days in particular, a lot of them are so sensitive about this, they almost don't want to hear it. There was always this argument, look, we were the ones bleeding and fighting and dying and you, know, you and your spam, you know, they call this is the Russian blood and spam. And I understand that perspective. On the other hand, there was never much gratitude either, nor, of course, was there any counter offers, that is to say that no leverage was applied to the Soviets, nor did Stalin make any concessions. I mean, to think, for example, that uh, the United States and Britain, because of course Britain is also sending not only some of her own material, but also uh, basically reconsigning some of her own lend -lease supplies or consignments uh, to, to Stalin, um, that all of this is happening at a time when it's not just that Stalin is making no concessions about post-war future of Europe or Asia, but where, again, I, I mentioned this before, I hate to repeat myself, but Stalin was arresting Allied pilots who were landing on Soviet soil after bombing raids on Japan and treating them as prisoners of war. Um, so that the Roosevelt administration wasn't even able to get him to stop doing that. Uh, I mean, it's, it's remarkable how little leverage they applied considering how much they should have been able to apply against the Soviets. Um, you know, Roosevelt, it's, it's almost plaintive. He asked Stalin again and again and again to help against Japan. Can you help in some way? Can you maybe allow us to have basing rights? Could you maybe allow uh, even the Lend-Lease planes, which are being flown over Alaska? The, the U.S. pilots, they're not even allowed to go as far as Nome. They have to stop in Fairbanks and let the Soviets take it even for the last refueling stop on U.S. soil before they go over to Siberia, uh, the Soviet Far East and, and route for Siberia. Mm. Whereas uh, the Soviets are allowed to, they basically take over Fairbanks. They take over the town. They take over Lad Air Base. Um, the Soviets pretty much take over this this whole strategic pipeline 
on U.S. soil. And any U.S. pilot who would have flown into the Soviet Far East would have been arrested and interned as, as a Soviet prisoner of war. Um, and so, you know, no concessions are given or offered uh, regarding, again, kind of the post-war settlement in places like Poland, Eastern Europe, or the Balkans. Uh, no concessions are offered. In fact, it goes all the other directions. Stalin gets Roosevelt, despite the fact that uh, the U.S. ships, in the end, uh, eight and a quarter, eight and, uh, and a quarter million tons of war material uh, to the Soviet Far East by way of Vladivostok, including a huge quantity just in the last 12 to 14 months of the Pacific War, which have been specifically requested to arm and equip and clothe and fuel the Soviet Far Eastern armies. You know, a, a, a campaign that's almost entirely funded and fueled and provisioned by the Americans. Uh, the Soviets insist as a price for using this American equipment to conquer Northern Asia, that Roosevelt, of course, agreed all these concessions in Manchuria, Sakhalin, the Kuril Islands, the Habamai Islands, and even Korea, uh, even North Korea. Um, and that is to say that not only did the U.S. not apply any leverage to get anything out of Stalin, it was more like the other direction. They, they allowed Stalin to basically name his own price in exchange for being given all this stuff essentially for free. I mean, it's at the level of, of diplomacy and negotiation, it's just an astonishingly net performance on the part of the Americans. Which leads us nicely to the other idea or thought that you bring up in the book that essentially Stalin was playing Roosevelt and Churchill and, and they, he got them fawning. And, and the thing is, again, as I said in, in emails to you, you know, I've looked at the negativity about some of the book and it's trying to say what you say over four chapters and 200 pages into like a soundbite and it's like but you're not actually saying this as a soundbite what you're doing is explaining things over several chapters but you are essentially in in not so fewer words saying that he was able to manipulate Churchill and, 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 and Roosevelt and and therefore that's why we weren't playing hardball not just in 1945 where it comes to Poland and it comes to the the, the, the map of the post-war world but earlier you know just as you said the the the, the be able to have some airfields there to deal with things. So, um, if that's the case, and you, I know there's the there's the there's the argument of the the Soviet agents who were kind of whispering in ears and things, and people saying and giving giving perhaps a warped view of exactly what was going on. And in a weird way, the Allies ended up believing their own Uncle Joe. They kind mm -hmm. of created the Uncle Joe image for the public, the, the American and British public. They ended up kind of believing it themselves, even though they knew it was sort of a a, a, a convenient falsehood to give to the to, to the to the people to suggest that's why we're working with the Russians and it's all okay because we're friendly. So, but that but this brings us this idea that to some extent Roosevelt and Churchill are untouchable now. They have reached a level of of um, celebration is not the right word. Re reverence, I suppose, is the word where if you start having a go at them in any way at all, it's but they won us the war. So. It, yeah. That that's that that's difficult, isn't it? Because we're not saying they're not they weren't great leaders, or we're just saying that when it came to dealing with Stalin, he he had them over a barrel in a sense. So and and it's and it's not just you saying this. You're you're pointing out examples of conversations and memoirs and letters and archives. It's not it's not your thought. It's what what you've discovered. So tell us a little bit more about how difficult it is to suggest that. Churchill and Roosevelt weren't weren't perfect, essentially. Well, it is. I mean, it is interesting. I mean, they're not perfect in the sense that now they get critics, you know, talk about other things. You know, they talk about, you're talking about like the Bengali famine, for example, or, you know, Churchill's record on labor, or in the case of Roosevelt, the internment of the Japanese Americans. Yeah. It's not that they don't get brickbats. It's that I think the type of people interested in military history, they have very strong opinions. And those yes. are the type who kind of either read a book like this or pay attention to a book like this. So to some extent, I'm almost kind of arguing against my own audience. You know, that is to say, I'm I'm presenting an argument which is slightly offensive to many of the likely readers of the book. And I've kind of discovered this, you know, in the process that I, I do want to distinguish, though, and differentiate really between Roosevelt and Churchill, because mm. while in the end, I do think Churchill is really forced to go along with most of what Roosevelt decides, um, simply because his own position, his own leverage is, is so much weaker. I mean, the Americans... Yeah really hold all the cards, especially after 1942 and 1943. Uh, I do think Churchill, uh, 
certainly manipulated to some extent as he was, and I think he got certain things wrong, and I think he did. There's a big argument. I mean, some people have pointed out, well, he had the Enigma intercepts proving the Yugoslavia case, which is kind of its own subject, that, you know, proving that he knew that Mihailovic was, was no good. You know, I've looked at the German files on Mihailovic. I've looked at the Soviet files on Mihailovic. I've looked at some of the Bulgarian files on Mihailovic and Tito, and you know, the story is not that simple. That is to say, uh, when you look at Yugoslavia, Churchill was hearing what he wanted to hear. He heard one side of the story. You know, so Churchill's not without fault. He's not without blemish. And I think he made some bad calls during the war. That said, I, I do think he tried. I think he tried to stand up to Stalin on numerous occasions. And, you know, not just with this notorious kind of naughty napkin episode in Moscow, uh, the Tolstoy conference in October 1944. But if you look really closely at Tehran, and this is, again, one of those subjects where I've, I've clearly stirred up a little bit of a hornet's nest, this question about allied strategy and the so-called Mediterranean or, or really more precisely Adriatic underbelly that Churchill was kind of favoring at the conference, this idea that the, the, the U.S. and Britain have all these resources and troops, and landing craft in Italy, and uh, perhaps in conjunction with, or perhaps before any assault on France, maybe they could have been used uh, to land troops somewhere on the Adriatic coast, probably not to push on directly over land because it's just so hard to get through that, that kind of tiny window in between the mountains and the sea yeah. up above, up above uh, Venice, you know, en route for what is now kind of Gorizia and Slovenia. Yes, that's true. On the other hand, they could have also landed troops. Um, and in fact, if you look at some of the German general's memoirs, this is exactly what they were expecting the Allies to do. They were, yeah. <laughs> they were kind of astonished they didn't do this. It was such an obvious move. Uh, the Germans had some troops in Yugoslavia, but Yugoslavia was mostly manned by the Bulgarians. Um, and of course, by then Italy had fallen, so the Italians weren't there anymore. It was basically a country occupied by Bulgaria. Uh, with Yeah, the Germans, are they're moving some troops in because they're worried about an allied landing there. But in fact, it's far less heavily guarded, of course, than let's say the, the French Channel coastline. And there's this a couple of critical moments at Tehran where it really is fascinating. You could sort of see the, you know, the the clicking as they're actually thinking through. And and Stalin, of course, is just aghast at the idea that the Allies are going to have troops anywhere in the Balkans or Eastern Europe. Because at the time the Soviets haven't even made it to Odessa yet. You know, they're still blundering around. Yeah. There's still hundreds of kilometers behind the old Soviet Reich border. You know, they're still basically in kind of central and eastern Ukraine and, you know, Belarusia. They're nowhere near the Reich borders yet. And the Allies are talking about possibly landing troops at some place like Trieste. And Stalin says, oh, but the Balkans are far from Germany. And I mean, here's where sometimes maybe I'm just such a simpleton that I kind of ask these questions that no one had ever asked before. Is it true that the Balkans are far from Germany? I just took out a map and I did some measurements. And I looked at it and I said, no, actually from Trieste to Munich is about half the distance from the Rhine to you know, Calais and, and Normandy. So it's not actually true. Now it is true, there are, there are mountain ranges, but um, you know, as we knew and as Churchill himself knew, and I mean, he himself of course had historical knowledge and experience and he knew that it had been critical at the end of the First World War that the Allied beachhead at Salonika, they had broken out when the Bulgarians, and again, it was the Bulgarians. Once again, the Bulgarians had essentially kind of collapsed for various reasons. And this opened up uh, the entirety, really, of the Balkans. And uh, the Germans in the First World War, uh, the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians, and by then it was mostly the Germans really doing the lion's share of the fighting. I mean, they didn't really have the troops to defend against both that and a breakout in the West. And this is pretty much what convinces Ludendorff that the game is up. You know, Churchill knew that. Uh, he knew it wasn't a guarantee, but that there were some very real possibilities. He also had this interest in Yugoslavia. I think he maybe, again, got things a little bit wrong about Tito and Mihailovic. But that said, whether it was in support of, of the partisans or Mihailovic, had it been U.S. and British troops in Yugoslavia, they might have actually shaped the post-war future of Yugoslavia, along with the rest of the Balkans and reached Hungary and maybe even Poland before the Red Army. So Stalin, you know, this for him is just like a non-starter. And this is the first moment when you can really see the serious break between Roosevelt and Churchill, because, of course, Roosevelt takes Stalin's side. And it's quite obvious what's happening. Everyone notices, you know, the body language and the kind of even a wink at one point that mm -hmm. Roosevelt has sided with Stalin. Um, you know, so Churchill was really kind of left out to dry. Um, and, you know, so I, I don't think it's entirely true that Churchill was manipulated to the extent that, that Roosevelt was. Um, you know, I just think it's it's kind of unfortunate that in the end, I think Roosevelt, and the thing is, it's not that Roosevelt wasn't capable of being tough as nails. He was with the British. I mean, he was extremely extremely hard-nailed, hard-nosed when it came to negotiating uh, 
the Lend-Lease terms with Britain, the basis for destroyers deal, financial aid terms, making sure the British went along with whatever the current U.S. priorities were. For whatever reason, he just didn't apply any of the same leverage to Stalin. Um, but isn't this perhaps just because, and this is, a, again, a simplistic way of looking at it, is Roosevelt kind of knew how to deal with the British? I mean, we'd had a a shared history, the same language, if, if, if as simple as that, and dealing with Stalin, as everybody who ever had to deal with Stalin, including his own people, is just very difficult because it's it's very, very complicated because of his idiosyncrasies, for want of a better word. So, yeah. you know, and like when you're talking about the possibility of going of, of, the, sec, of a, the front starting in the Adriatic somewhere, you know, we talk about how difficult it was even to get the relative seemingly simple task of getting de Gaulle to agree to send a single message to the people of France. Exactly how complicated might it have been for, to send a message to all the various factions in Yugoslavia and Bulgaria and Hungary, and which are cha- Romania is changing week by week where its loyalties and, uh, and ambitions are lying. So maybe there's a sort of a, uh, going for the simple option so he can be hardball with the British because he just kind of knows how to press our buttons. And yeah, this, uh, first, first, the, whole, the point of your book is 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 really to look at the war through the Russian Stalin lens, as opposed to always looking through the Western lens and looking to Stalin's reactions. Is that it, there's a there's a way of looking at it where the focus the focus is how the Stalin and his people are are perceiving the events around them, and that essentially is a re, is a refreshing a new way of looking at World War Two. Well, no, you're, you're absolutely right about, I think, Stalin and Roosevelt and how difficult it would have been for Roosevelt to try to get anything out of Stalin, really. It's not that he didn't try at times. I talked about these kind of almost plaintive requests for help against Japan, for basing rights. Uh, I, I know we'll maybe move into the Warsaw Uprising next, but even there, yeah. you know, you're just getting landing rights uh, near Poltava, you know, in Ukraine at this base to, to aid the rebels. It, you know, it was like getting blood from a stone to get anything out of Stalin. And, and so I think to that extent, one certainly sympathizes with Roosevelt's position and dilemma. If you flip it around, uh, you, know, you know, I don't see why he was quite so concerned with always trying to please Stalin. But from Stalin's perspective, I mean, the thing is, I, I think you, you could obviously read the book as just this vitriolic critique of Stalin, but that's not actually how I see it. I'm, I'm constantly amazed at just how effective he was. He just about always got his way in these negotiations. Uh, he almost never gave ground. He almost never gave an inch. Um, and so you're absolutely right that it's difficult, I think, for Roosevelt to deal with someone like that. Um, you know, they could have applied leverage. And okay, one, one objection that might also be made, you're talking about how difficult it would have been to carry out this campaign in the Adriatic. I personally think certainly no more difficult than D-Day, probably uh, considerably easier, logistically speaking. However, politically and strategically speaking, Stalin always had this kind of implied threat that had the Allies not given him his way, maybe he could have negotiated something behind the scenes with Hitler again. That is to say, he could have pulled out of the war. Yeah, there's that ace there he could possibly pull out there, which is... Which right. is- Vastly. But yeah, so let's, for the purposes of just moving through the things we want to talk about, let's talk about the Warsaw Uprising, because it is a subject we've tackled a couple of times. We've we've tackled, tackled it with Alexandra Ritchie, talked about it from the point of view of I mean, the city. We've talked about it from the um, the, the, the Jewish aspect with Alina Lovabilska. We've also had Douglas Nash on talking about the SS fighting in the air and there. But and in all of those shows, one of the questions that was raised by viewers and me and the presenters is that the Stalin's involvement or non-involvement and what he was, what he saw was happening there. So, okay, it's always going to be opinions on this because going back and trying to understand what he actually really wanted. But what is your take on Stalin's eventual lack of involvement? He was just, he wasn't, as we know, he wasn't very far. There's an army just across the river. Yeah. Um, and he chooses, or, or it is said that Stalin himself chooses not to not commit to assisting the Poles in Warsaw. So, so what's what's your feeling on that? I know I've read the book myself personally, but for those watching, what explain a little bit more on that? Well, sure. There, there are a couple of different elements in play here. I mean, one, you have just this somewhat obvious decision where Stalin can at least claim he's deferring to the judgment of his commanders in the ground or Rukosovsky, and there's this German offensive, you know, Modell's army kind of comes in and there's a, a threat on the flanks. So yes, they withdraw. And there could have been, let's say, a plausible military strategic reason uh, for, for this kind of tactical withdrawal, which basically lasts the whole critical month of August. Um, 
But there are other layers to this too. Um, you know, Stalin at times is actually lying through his teeth, you know, when he tells the allies, for example, that this is this reckless and terrible adventure and they had been given no prior warning or notice about it. No, in fact, I mean, the Poles, you know, they actually had an envoy in Moscow yeah. Basically told the Russians what they were going to do and ask for support. So you know he was just lying through his teeth about that. As far as his approach to it, certainly there was the kind of tactical withdrawal, the refusal to help. There was also the refusal to grant landing rights uh, to U.S. and RAF pilots uh, who were going to try to get supplies to the rebels. And uh, you know he he kept this permission completely withdrawn until I believe September 9th, You know by which point basically the old town and most of Warsaw. Yeah, you know, there was still resistance in pockets, but basically most the time when it would have made the difference has unfortunately passed. Yeah, you know, I mean, that much is clear. But, you know, there are other layers that I think aren't generally always emphasized in your kind of more general histories of the war, that it wasn't just about kind of this callous indifference. But he's actually at the same time that he's sort of deceiving Roosevelt and Churchill uh, and refusing, obviously, to, to offer any succor, or aid or help. He's also issuing orders uh, that any home army or AK army of Krajewa fighters that the Red Army encounters or you know, his, his secret police encounters, that they are to be disarmed and, and arrested. Uh, so it's not just that he doesn't want to help them. He makes quite clear that his intentions toward them are malign. That is to say, he sees them as a, a potential hostile force. It's not hard to see why. I mean, this they are basically the kind of the you know the nucleus of the Polish army on the ground, which answers to the Polish exile government in London, with which Stalin had broken relations uh, over the, the Katyn massacre controversy the previous year in 1943. Uh, basically, he called them fascist. This was his official mm -hmm. line. You know, so they were kind of like a, a peasant army serving an illegitimate exile government of fascists um, and you know he wants them out of the way um, so even after the uprising uh, while the Germans of course succeed in either disarming or arresting the vast majority of the home army fighters by the time the uprising is, is finally crushed um, some of them of course do escape some of them had also not been in Warsaw they're just out in the country and what happens in the months after the Warsaw uprising is to me at least is interesting which is to say this is when uh, Stalin's men on the ground, the Berlingowski, the kind of, you know, the, his, his, his puppet army in Poland, um, they go around hunting down the Polish home army fighters. And so, and I mean, the, the element of this, which tied back to Lenlace we were talking about before, mm -hmm. was, I did discover this, you know, in the Warsaw archives, although curiously enough, these are actually Russian documents, um, you know, basically these kind of orders given out um, you know, by the Soviets, by Soviet officers and consuls and officials uh, to their Polish puppets, um, but also gifts that they're giving out to them, which is to say they were actually re-gifting them Lend-Lease equipment, including Willis Jeeps, including Dodge trucks, and most strikingly of all, including Harley Davidson motorcycles. So that's what they're actually riding on is going around Poland, basically crushing what remains of the Polish Home Army. Not entirely successfully, mind you. In fact, resistance continues well on into 1945 and 1946. Absolutely. Um, so that you know, the Stalin's position again. Once again, it's although there's all this kind of you know lying and manipulation going on. His actual policy is quite consistent. It's quite clearly stated. This is a sort of a, a an, you know, an illegitimate peasant you know army of class enemies serving this fascist government in exile in London. He's, he's quite unsubtle about this. I mean, it's remarkable to me that yes, it would have been hard for Roosevelt and Churchill to deal with someone like this. On the other hand, it's it's amazing to me just how blunt he actually was in his communications with them. Yeah, and and considering as again that that we have, well, I'm saying we from the point of view of Churchill and Roosevelt, they have this bar, rather large bargaining chip of the Studebakers and the spam and the and the air cobras and all the stuff that, that that is being sent that way. That you kind of thought that as they're handing it over, they could kind of keep holding it until they get at least something in agreement. But perhaps they. The point is, is is any kind of deal with so the Soviets worth the paper it's written on? You know, that's the thing. They could say, we'll do this. And is it worth anything anyway? So, so you know, the devil's advocate could say, maybe there's no point doing a deal with a guy who inherently isn't right. trustworthy, you know, and, and he could sign as many papers as he wants. Mm. When it, if, if Stalin being the kind of guy he is, he'll change his mind because he's Stalin. He, he, he is, he's a maniac. He's, he, ha um, so, I mean, you know, that, that's an interesting perspective that, yes, we're seeing the fact they're not holding him very to, to much account, but maybe we're putting on him, if you like, Western values of a deal is a deal. You know, the way I was raised, if I shake someone's hand in a pub and I agree to do something, that's it. That's a, 
a pretty much un, unwavering deal. But that's maybe not, well, not maybe, that's not how Stalin works, is it? Well, you did, the only thing I would offer to counter that, I mean, there's a large element of truth there. I mean, Stalin obviously was never going to be easy to deal with, and any deal that was negotiated might have been subject to amendment, to put it mildly. However, they kept offering Stalin things which he didn't have yet, uh, which is to say, the settlement regarding Poland was negotiated long before the Red Army arrived in Poland. Sure. Um, uh, the future of Yugoslavia was determined at a time when it was actually the British who were supplying the partisans of Yugoslavia, not Stalin. Um, when it comes to Asia, it's even more dramatic. Um, it's not just that, let's say you say, right, any deal with Stalin might have been uh, you know, subject to, to Stalin's revisions. Uh, the Allies certainly didn't have to promise Stalin a sphere of interest in Manchuria and North Korea and Sakhalin and the Kuril Islands and even, um, some of the Havam Islands. They didn't have to offer him any of that at a time when he was effectively neutral in helping Japan. Nor did they have to, of course, send him and ship him the arms that he used uh, to occupy and seize all of those territories. Um, you know, there there was there were a few assessments, and it's part of like the mysteries of to some extent espionage, but also I suppose just office politics that. Uh, only one of the assessments made its way to Roosevelt before Yalta. Uh, that is to say, there was kind of either an optimistic or pessimistic assessment regarding Japan and her ability to resist. Uh, the more optimistic one was effectively that, yes, while the kamikaze planes were a nuisance, generally speaking, Japanese morale you know, was not great, um, and that the war could be ended without the need for Soviet help. You know, the other one were so desperate, we absolutely must give Stalin whatever he demands in exchange for the promise of intervention. You know, again, three months after the European war is over and not a moment sooner, those were Stalin's other terms. Um, and those were apparently non-negotiable. Um, the thing is the US didn't have to stick to that. In fact, curiously enough, I mean, there, there are also two counterexamples where Truman tries to wiggle out of it at the last moment. You know, That is to say, when, once they test the A-bomb and they think that they can maybe get Japan to submit, they cut Stalin out of the Potsdam Declaration. Uh, which seems to indicate that despite promising all of this to Stalin, despite sending him all that war material, they were having second thoughts at the last minute. Um, and they nearly tried to muscle the Soviets out of the war. And there's obviously a lot of controversy about that. By then, though, the die was really cast. You know, the promises had already been made. Um, and interestingly, um, when it finally push came to shove and they started talking about the lines of demarcation, both in Korea itself and also when Stalin makes his last demand for one of the Japanese home islands for Hokkaido, Truman actually said no. Uh, he put his foot down, uh, first of all, because it hadn't been promised to Stalin at Yalta or in any subsequent agreements. And second of all, because you know, he was tougher than Roosevelt was vis-a-vis -vis Stalin, um, which does show that, you know, I think at the very least you have one counterexample. And who knows, maybe by then Roosevelt might have come around to a stronger position too, but that you did have a different statesman taking a different position and in fact getting Stalin to accept his terms. And, and, and that's one of the things that, one can't help when reading your book what would have happened had Roosevelt died two or three months early or, or relinquished his position or retired, whatever it would be, and Truman had come in earlier because a very different figure at the negotiation table um, and, 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 and rather rather forgotten about in terms of history. The only thing anyone mo most would know about Truman is, is the, the idea of him having to be the one to say yes to the A bomb. That's that's pretty much what most people know. And and he kind of outside of that, he's sort of fallen off the radar a little bit. Yeah. Um for, for various reasons. But in order to kind of bring things slowly towards an end now, I mean, as a, as a as someone who teaches history, you know, you, you mentioned your students a couple of times during the show. The, the last thing you want after doing a big long course is to say at the end of it, any questions and no one reply. You want people to go, but surely, but didn't. And essentially, that's what your book does. I, I have to read an awful lot of books um, for what I'm doing now. And, and I enjoy nearly all of them. And there's the, here's what this division did on this date, pushing towards that, the understanding a battle to a greater level than I had before books. And I love those ones. And there's the other ones. And there's not that many of them. Adam Tooze's Way to Destruction a few years ago was one. And, and um, uh, Tim Cook's uh, book about the understanding of Canada's uh, mm -hmm. understanding its past was one that made me think. And yours is one of those ones that make me think. And so, so I was reminded of when I did an interview with Frank McDonough about his wonderful two-volume book on Hitler. And towards the end, Frank's a very humble Liverpudlian and and he said, I, I absolutely expect my book to be out of date within within 10 years. And I would hope it would be out of date within five years. Now, that mm -hmm. struck me as being something really quite refreshingly humble from a historian, because 
there's this idea when a book comes out, people just label it as this is the definitive book on D-Day. This is the definitive book on air power in the West or whatever it would be. And it seems to me that you don't really want your book to necessarily be the definitive, but just to start mm. the conversations. You know, you've thrown the grenade, the, the metaphorical grenade in the room and, and, and brought up some ideas, Lendley's, Truman, Deals, and, and kind of walked away and are now hoping that other people will take some of these things and, and either push back or agree, but certainly continue the work. And I think that from that point of view, I want to sort of thank you for what you've done with this, even though you have had some pushback. And I didn't agree with everything in your book, but there's lots of things I thought, well, that absolutely makes sense. But the point is, it's one of those books that made me just sit afterwards going for like two hours. And some books just don't do that. So was that something that you, you thought was going to happen? Or was that something that you were glad happened? Or the react because we know it's what mm. it was it came out april was it came out april uh april yeah so you've now had that few months of 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 response to it beyond the, you know obviously the media people you sent copies to earlier but so is it doing what you wanted it to do i think for the most part um i mean obviously i i prefer that the arguments be relatively civil um but i i do expect uh, to provoke argument i did expect to provoke argument uh, your 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 point about wanting the book to become obsolete is such an interesting one because there's part of me that really would love for someone to actually make it into the soviet archives and write a definitive history of the contribution of for example lenlees to the soviet war effort um and i would be the first to tip my hat and say congratulations well done um i'm pretty sure it's not going to happen though and it's not going to happen because the little I was able to get out of the Soviet archives, I'm pretty sure it's probably been sealed up again now, in part because of the reaction to my book, uh, particularly in Russia, the fact that this is a sensitive subject. And in fact, even, uh, since I think Antony Beaver was the last major Western historian to be able to do serious work in the Soviet military archives in Podolsk, um, and you know, even to get a kind of a researcher on the ground to get access to that material, I think would be virtually impossible now. Um, regarding the the kind of the diplomacy of the war, I, I don't think there's any way of, of definitively settling those arguments. Um, but I do hope and expect uh, that more research will be inspired by the book. Um, and again, not everything has been declassified, even in Britain and the United States. I mean, we still have our own secrets as well. Um, so yeah. there are some things we we never fully have an answer I mean, yeah exactly there, there are certain documents that just don't exist or are, will never been never be found or were destroyed and despite how much for example the world still speculates about for example something like hitler's sexuality there's no <laughs> way we can't go back now and sit him on a psychiatrist chair as we can't with Stalin or any of these so there's always going to be opinion about what the the um the motivation behind what the inward thinking of any of these people were because we okay lots of generals wrote their memoirs some of the some of the leaders wrote their memoirs but your memoirs are are, are not necessarily a true reflection of what they were thinking at the moment things were happening as we know from the Churchill quote he knows he was going to come out well out of history because he was going to write it himself so mm. we there there's there's always going to be room for interpretation of these events. There's always going to be room for people saying, I can't be certain, but I would assume that on this day here, he is thinking in this sort of way. This, he, he's going to be buoyed by this or upset by this or responding, responding to this particular incident in an angry way because you can kind of track the previous reactions he's made or what we perceive them to be, because that's the thing. Everything we're written, we, we weren't there. You weren't in the room. You weren't at Yalta. You weren't at um, any of these big conferences or meetings. So, and the people who respond to them and talked about them, they talked about them differently the minute after they happened than they did ten years ago or twenty years later. And and that's why it's always refreshing to just study these these subjects from a new angle and just throw those thoughts out there and get people thinking. I, I, I think it's imperative. That's why we do it. And um, so the conversation then can continue. Absolutely. Well, I think, you know, but again, there's, we just simply can't tackle everything that's in your book. So I'm going to tell people, if you haven't read this book already, just go out and get it because it just spins things around, get you thinking and makes you think of things in a way you hadn't thought about before. And, and I found I found myself diving to other books and thinking, okay, what does Richard Overy think about that? And I wonder what Adam Toos has, has he got anything about that particular meeting there, or 
um, other people, like Frank and McDonough, for another person there. And it, it, and, and it, I found out that some of your ideas were, were replicated in other books and some it, people had a completely 180 on it. And I thought, mm -hmm. and I, it, didn't, it didn't help me in some ways because you just, you, but it does just make me think about things. And I think that's important. So um, I'm just going to remind people what we got coming up and I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second. So folks, um, I hope you enjoyed that rather sort of interesting discussion. So we just literally scratched the surface of what there is in Stalin's voice. So I just thoroughly recommend you go out there and get it. We have um, one more show as part of Eastern Front Week, which we're talking about artillery tomorrow. A very, very data driven talk uh, by Sasha, who's an American lawyer, about just exactly what caused the casualties on the Eastern Front. It's a really Great pro, uh, presentations put together, so that'll be, that'll be good. Then Jungles Week starts on Saturday. We've got Guadalcanal and John Bazalo on Saturday and lots more things, and Alamo Scouts on Sunday. So that'll be Jungles Week. But right now, um, it remains me to say thank you very much, Sean McMeekin, for joining us. And, and I just can't wait for you to tackle another subject. I know it's mostly kind of the East you're interested, but I, 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 I kind of like you to tackle kind of the, the whole Normandy and and. The, the Patton Montgomery, because I feel you'd have something new to say about that, that would probably have it be going to some things and hurling the book across the room to others, which is the reaction we should be getting from books. Books should, should challenge us. So um, thank you very much for joining us. And I know we've only just tapped into the incredible um, thoughts you have about Stalin and the war. And, and it's, as I say, we, you made the point at the beginning of it, it's not a study of the battles I and mean, neither it is a biography of Stalin. And, and, and yet it still manages to cram in 800 pages of thoughts. So it's <laughs> absolutely fantastic. So I hope you enjoy joining us and I look forward to inviting you for another appearance when, when you do your next work. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. It was, it was okay. great. Thanks, then. So this is Paul Woodard from World War II TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow for a talk about artillery. Thank you very much for watching, everybody.